Uh, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, whatever day it may be for you, whether it's Wednesday or Thursday, welcome to another live stream. So glad to see so many familiar names and faces in the chat. Charlemagne says, please play the Final Fantasy uh, Seven battle music when it starts. But uh, one, I don't want to deal with copyright. Two, I've actually never played Final Fantasy, so... Uh, call me a heathen, whatever. But anyways, let's get to the subject matter at hand. We're going to have an interesting discussion rather than perhaps just quote tweets and Twitter back and forth. I think Red Hawk is used to that with uh, Nolan Nose. So we have an outline for today's discussion. So I'm going to introduce our, our wonderful guests tonight. Um, I'll start with uh, the Black Horse. How are you? Not too bad. How about you? I cannot complain, all things considered. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background. I know that many might know you from Radlib streams or your excellent econ research, but uh, give you a good chance to introduce yourself. Yeah, well, I actually got started streaming uh, as a guest for Lambda uh, on his Bible study stream. Uh, I would characterize my views as both Christian and reactionary. Um, and relevantly for this discussion, um i've been married i've been married for almost 11 years now i've got three kids uh that's kind of the stage of life i'm at, I'm at. we very much have a traditional christian marriage um you know uh we were both virgins when we got married all that all that good stuff so uh when red hawk wrote a couple of pieces for his sub stack stack uh critiquing the sort of conservative Christian sec sexual ethic. Um, I thought that it would be useful. I reached out to him to, to reply to his Substack directly. He suggested we have a conversation. And so uh, here we are. Well, wonderful. I'm glad that we're here to all have this uh, conversation then. Red Hawk, while many might think you may need no introduction, go, let's go ahead and give you the proper courtesy and introduce yourself. Right. So um, I have uh, basically come out, it, ironically, it's almost like an entire year now since I did my first stream with uh, AA on the women question. And uh, basically since then, I've uh, been, you know, the arch circle of the internet, um, you know, uh, pick up uh, Manosphere kind of go-to guy uh, that we're going towards. And um, basically relevancy to my conversation, I'm a guy in my late twenties who's been in, um, you know, uh, pickup and, uh, Manusfield circles for about, uh, four to five years now. And that's where I'm at right now. Uh, I spin plates. Uh, I do not, uh, have like, a, a monogamous, uh, you know, relationship currently. And, uh, it's not really a long term goal for me, uh, at least until I'm in my thirties. Um, so that's, uh, where I'm at right now. Uh, well, uh, all right, now that we've kind of got the, the term started out, I think that this might be a better alternative as to what Charlemagne is suggesting. It's just settling it over a game of uh, Smash Bros. Melee, but hey. <laughs> I would I would absolutely lose that because the characters I would play in Smash Bros. are the lowest tier. Um, no, so. see, I, I, I'm old enough, and uh, you know, I grew up in a world where it was verboten to have uh, a gaming system in our house. So... Uh, you know, I, I have boomer level skills for those those kind of games. Well, I've never played it too much of it either, except when I went over to like friends' houses. So actually, we would all just get a whole stream from Charlemagne saying that we suck. So it would kind of all work out. Um, but I also probably for clarification real quick, um, this is uh, from chat because this is a good question to ask. Um, Black Horse, do you mind sort of identifying if there's a specific denomination or church? Yeah, I'm a Reformed Baptist. With? There we go. Reformed Baptist answers that question. Um, so, uh, the, well, let's really uh, just get started then. So we have our our discussion. Um, we had an, we had an outline that was written to us actually. So let's uh, let's get started then. Um, where do you so, want to start here, Black Horse? Because you had written out this sort of outline for what you guys. Yeah. So I think about. the the right place to start. There's kind of two elements to where to what I see as Red Hawk's ideas. There's elements of the diagnosis and then there's elements of the prescription. And I think we'll probably find more common ground on the diagnosis than we will on the prescription. So why don't we start there? Mm. So the first kind of element of the diagnosis that I've seen in Red Hawk's work is a broad uh, view that the, current, the currently dominant sexual ethic in our culture is radically dysfunctional. So, uh, Red Hawk, do you want to fill f fill out for the audience why you think that is? 
Yeah, sure. So uh, my basic uh, position in uh, thesis uh, comes to down to that. What is primarily uh, the main, uh, I guess you can call, um, uh, you know, dominant system in society in the West and the first world today is a uh, gynocentrism, which is um, female first um, social order. And this ties into, um, you know, feminism, affirmative action, abortion, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, sexual dynamics, all that kind of stuff. And my main objection to that is that uh, women simply do not build societies. Uh, men do. Uh, men always have, they make the rules, they uh, tame the nature, and then women will go about and enforce uh, man's will onto the next generation through the raising of uh, man's offspring. And this is becoming a very, very big problem now in our societies where it's becoming very feminized. We have women being affirmative action uh, placed into positions in the military, in uh, finance, in government, in you know, the corporate world, in the workplace. And this is resulting in very dysfunctional families, very dysfunctional you know, uh, family formation um, and corporate sphere, politics, literally everything. I think this is probably the biggest problem that the West is facing these days. And I see a counter to this to reinstate uh, men in positions of power and authority. So that's my goal above all else is men need authority back, uh, not just in you know um, the family, but also in politics and the military and, and everything. Yeah, I would certainly agree with a lot of that diagnosis. I mean, uh, our my perspective would be that, uh, I mean, from, from the point of view of scripture, uh, um, women, as the leadership class of a society is actually something that God curses certain nations with at certain times. Um, so I think there's a, a pretty unambiguous problem, not just at the level of the sort of family dynamic, but at the level of the social dynamic with the, uh, the way in which uh, women are broadly viewed. So that that's, that's the case. It's interesting to me that you, first went to problems at the level of society with the social with the sexual ethic that dominates our culture rather than problems at the level of of the individual with that sexual ethic uh why why was that the the way you chose to go uh like obviously the the sexual ethic that is dominant in our culture isn't working for individuals either um i mean the the internet is littered with the corpses of 40 year old divorced men uh, mm -hmm. who have had their kids taken from them. Uh, why is it you chose to uh, highlight the sort of civilizational level problems rather than the individual level problems? Mm, good question. Um, basically, the reason why I go more on the um, society, um, you know, uh, standpoint is because and this relates into a lot uh, when I'm giving advice to guys is that you have to make your own way uh, as a man. Um, so there are like broad tools that the red pill, the community that I'm most associated with, there are tools, it's a toolbox that you can use for certain situations, but you have to be wise enough and um, also um, have like a, a degree of uh, self-understanding of yourself to know what tools to, you at, to use at which time. And that's why I, I generally on these kinds of conversations, I focus more on the, you know, the societal level, because as it relates to the individual guy, that's going to be his life to live. That's going to be uh, his way to walk through his current situation, whether he wants to spin plates or whether he wants to have um, a successful marriage or whether he wants to go MGTOW, uh, whatever he wants to do, uh, that's going to be up to him. And it's not uh, my responsibility to make those choices for him. Interesting. Interesting. I, I will note that I think it's important to identify that this is both an individual and sort of societal level. I think mm -hmm. that a lot of what does socialize individuals, whether they're raised in a church or raised in a secular society, um, that society outside of their parents is going to be a major role in socializing. Now, I, when looking at the problem, and, and I know that this is something that we can all sort of, I think, begin to acknowledge, right, is, is that we are... 60 years or almost 60 years to the date um next year i think it'll be at 60 since we sort of legalized through this invented rule at least in the united states 
of this invented right of privacy to use sort of contraception uh, between married couples, which sort of exploded within a 10 year time frame to be ubiquitous writ large in law. Um, and that sort of fundamentally shifted the nature of relationships because the power that women had with regards to agency for, you know, you can have my child or you can, you know, put a baby in me, so to speak, um, you know, it changed. And I, I think despite sort of the fights back and forth that Red Hawk you've had with Nolan knows, I think his video that he did on the pill was sort of a fantastic societal and individual level breakdown in regards to agency and how this affects um, our relationships to between men and women. And yeah, that in turn I, also affects on the individual level. I will say that, I mean, the pill is obviously a, a huge part of this, but the extreme wealth of modern Western society, I think has a role here mm. because it, it's certainly the case that there are many single women with young children running around who are doing just fine and they're doing just fine even if their ex-husbands aren't financing it um and they're doing just fine in that circumstance because our society is I extremely generous towards them and that generosity is uh a consequence of the extreme wealth of, of, of the western world and so even over and above the changes in relationship dynamic that were um rent by the introduction of birth control you also have this historically unique situation where women who are fundamentally not working for large swaths of their life are able to feed themselves and their children without the assess without the assistance of a, a husband yeah yeah this is um to well on that point uh, i'll first address some um, uh the point about the pill and uh, I've said on stream before that um, uh, the birth control pill uh, has had a greater effect on humanity than the hydrogen bomb has. And uh, it is. Yeah, I think that's difficult to argue against. Yeah, it is uh, something we might as well be two separate species at this point um, after that, because we're the only species on planet Earth that has 100 percent control of uh, the birthing process. And uh, even crucially, so uh, one sex in our species has that because men have zero reproductive rights uh, in the West, you know, so and this relates into divorce courts and all that stuff, which also ties into what you were just mentioning, Black Horse, about the extreme wealth of the West and which the, you know, one half of women's hypergamy, the beta buck side is completely satisfied to them via the state, via welfare, or via, you know, they can just go and work for themselves, you know. So w whether that's a, you know, a crummy job or, you know, uh, what uh, with a college degree or whatever, you know, so it's a big problem. On, on that point, since we kind of mentioned the, the level of agreement on the pill, I think that that'd be a good place to start is where are the areas in which you two gentlemen would agree on besides perhaps just the objective prescription or your observation of how it is right now for men or what men should be doing in this you know, day and age? Um, well, I mean, I think we would certainly um, agree that, you know, uh, sulking around and uh, bitching about things isn't going to fix the problem. Um, you know, it doesn't uh, behoove you to be, um, you know, complaining on the internet that uh, life isn't fair if you're a man and women get all these advantages. Um, it's not going to serve you well. You have to go out and uh, make something of yourself. Uh, so I think Black Horse and I would definitely agree on that front that, um, you know, just sitting around and talking about things isn't going to fix the problem. I, I would also think we agree that women themselves find themselves in, you know, what what sort of evolutionary psychologist guys would call an evolutionary mismatch, where they're not psychologically adapted for the position that they find themselves in. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose that it's also true of of uh, non-alpha males at the moment, uh, where uh, the existence of the birth control pill, uh, the sort of social signaling they're getting as a consequence of the extremely wealthy society that, that exists here, these are not the environment that, uh, that women are sort of biologically adapted for. Um, and so, when they take advantage of all of this power that is given to them, uh, they find themselves miserable at the end of it. No different than uh, when sort of 
uh, low status men attempt the mating strategies that they're biologically adapted to att attempt and find that they fail miserably. Um, they, they, you know, are obviously very unhappy with that. Yeah, they become despondent. Basically, we have both sides uh, right now that aren't coming together to play the traditional game. And uh, both sides are incredibly unhappy. And, um, you know, the, uh, what is it? Um, antidepressants, that's what it is. The use amongst uh, women has increased an absurd amount, many hundred percent um, over the last uh, 25 to 30 years. You know, and um, I've linked to this study before uh, on my Twitter. Uh, Morgan Stanley, uh, two years ago, just before the coup, um, put out a study called Rise of the She Economy. And in that study, um, they were talking about how all these big hedge funds are moving money around in anticipation for by 2030, when 50%, that's five zero, of uh, working women between the ages of 20 and 45 will be single and childless in the, in the United States. That's right. And not... And single, childless, and miserable is probably uh, the unstated third premise. Right. Um, so uh, we we have you know something like seventy percent of the population that's biologically not adapted for the social social situation that they find themselves in, and it's a, a really nasty problem. Uh, Red Hawk uh, has uh, you know decided to take on the case of the large percentage of men that find themselves you know uh in an evolutionary mismatch between their actual position and the position that they're sort of biologically programmed to think that they're in and that's great but there's you know it's it's no it's not that this is all working out great for the women either no it's very true um in the, in some ways uh women are actually the um the ones that suffer the most from this uh because um no matter what happens, um, you know, women's sexual strategy ends up becoming their survival strategy at the end of the day. Um, I do think that to an extent, even though I don't believe that this is something that everyone should be striving for, I do believe you will find way more men that would be happy uh, single into the end of their days than you would find uh, women that are you know single to the end of their days. Uh, it's just we're just wired differently. Our, our psychology is totally different on this. Which brings us to kind of the next interesting issue. So, uh, well, we'll, op we'll open with a question here. Um, mating strategies that women are sort of hardwired to, uh, to employ, I think we'll find agreement here as well. So why don't you kind of outline what you, th what you would think a, a typical mating strategy for women at a psychological level looks like? Um, well, uh, well, women's sexual strategy is um, hypergamy, and people will argue with me about this and say this has changed, and this is totally not the case. Um, so it comes in two parts: uh, alpha fucks and beta bucks. Uh, basically, um, the the kind of man that uh, gets you hot and bothered and satisfied, and also can protect you, and mixed with uh, the man that can also uh, provide for you and take care of you and your offspring. Now, uh, this is extremely difficult to find in one man. So traditionally, um, this would be compensated by you know, uh, either uh, cuckoldry, which was far more common throughout our uh, past than people would like to admit, or, you know, in modern inventions where uh, basically single mothers get knocked up by the alpha male guy and then the, the beta buck state or themselves uh, will uh, satisfy the beta side of hypergamy. Yeah, I mean, I would say that uh, women select mates on the basis of perceived male status. Um, and male status runs along, you know, different dimensions. Uh, male status certainly runs along in economic hierarchy. There's a reason why very wealthy people get a lot more attention from women than mm -hmm. uh, than than poor guys do. But you're you're correct in identifying that there's some other axis uh, along which it runs as well. Um, there, there's something the the person that you're identifying as an alpha male there's 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 something to that that's not that's part of a male dominance hierarchy that's predicated on something other than economics um and i think if, if you study like political theory or if you study male dominance hierarchies more broadly you'll notice that there's different kinds of male dominance hierarchies 
and economic ones are are just a subcase of a broader uh, phenomena of male dominance hierarchies. Right. And um, also, let's not be mistaken here, because this also gets misconstrued a bunch and people immediately assume that alpha means good and beta means bad. And that's kind of because it's been memed into, you know, beta is soy boy and stuff like that. And that's not the case. These are just different uh, tools that we use as placeholder terms to get different reactions um, from women. So alpha traits are what attract women to you and beta traits is what keeps a woman around. And um, you do need both um, for a re relationship to be uh, fruitful in the long term. But again, this goes back to what I said at the beginning. It basically goes out, uh, goes with uh, what the man wants. You know, if he wants to spin plates, he's going to want to over-index in alpha traits. And if you want a, you know, a loving marriage, you're going to want to over-index in beta traits. Yeah. You know? So. Well, I mean, yes and no. If you over-index in beta traits, uh, you're going to find that your happy marriage is vulnerable to disruption um, oh, right. yeah you need a balance but there's tools that you use at certain times like um you can't just be going rambo uh in a um you know a marriage every time saying oh uh, comply or goodbye or get the fuck out when you have you know four kids in the household you know it doesn't really work that way and well, this is another example, interesting part you know? this is another interesting part of of the diagnosis right because women change profoundly psychologically after they have children That's especially right. when those children are young especially when those children are breastfeeding um, yeah absolutely true so uh i would one of the one of the areas that where i would kind of if if i were to broadly characterize one of my uh, value-free criticisms of your work is is that because of your target audience, you're very focused on women in a very particular stage in their life. But of course, mm -hmm. women, you know, live from birth to you know eighty, and most of those years aren't the aren't the years that you guys are peak targeting them. Uh, and so, obviously, the years that you're not peak targeting them tend to get less attention. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, to, yeah, to an extent. I mean, it just goes after, you know, the different kinds of uh, people I'm addressing and my audience and stuff like that. And that's also, you know, going to be the, uh, the norm in most cases, as I was mentioning with um, that study come 2030, this yeah. uh, demographic is only going to increase, you know, um, and also, um, you know, there's tools that I direct people towards if they want, um, you know, um, assistance and, you know, uh, like a marriage red pill and stuff like that. I mean, I'm, I mean, I know the material, but I'm not qualified to speak on it because I'm not married. You know. Well, so. I, I mean, the reality is uh, there are, as we've discussed so far, there are elements of what you would call the red pill that are just psychological insights about the nature of men and women that, uh, you know, are uncomfortable for a lot of people and that they're not sort of psychologically capable of, of dealing with properly, right? Very and, true those those psychological ins insights are actually quite useful when dealing with people not just for the purposes of uh attempting to um attempting to mate. Yeah. that's right <laughs> they're, they're useful for all sorts of reasons right uh understanding what does and does not make your your wife your daughter etc happy yeah. and understanding what it means to be like one of the interesting applications of the insights of the red of the red pill is that the the insights of the red pill um, have a lot of application to the role the proper role of fathers in the life of their daughters uh, mm -hmm. but true. Uh, those insights are very rarely uh, sort of taken on board because neither the target audience nor the promoters of the red pill are typically uh, fathers from traditional societies where they have you know when I married my wife, there was a 0% chance that I would have married my, I would have been able to marry my wife if, if her father didn't approve of me. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is not typical of, of most uh, people in the broad culture. Uh, and so they don't kind of think in those terms, but I, I think it's very hard to argue at a psychological level that this is not healthy behavior. Right, right. And I very much agree with that. I think one of the points of, of objection that I often run into when I'm having these kinds of conversations, more so with um, the more Christian among our uh, circles, is that, yes, I agree that that's what you're going to be looking for and what you would want, ideally. But the fact of the matter is that it's extremely rare and becoming even more so. The situation you describe, I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
So in terms of uh, the, so the next, the next piece is the prescription, right? So I, I was, I was about to say, it seems like we have a pretty hefty amount that we agree on, at least for you two to yeah, maybe perhaps the- getting into where there might be disagreement. Cause to me, it really does seem like the disagreement that I've been witnessing that Red Hawk runs into, especially with many of the traditionalists and Christian minded of us all. I know that, uh, Red Hawk and I have had conversations about it. I know that he's probably had a, a go with almost everyone in, in these circles that is Christian on Twitter. Um, I think it does kind of boil down to uh, praxology. Um, like, what is the prescription that we need to be offering to to cure this issue? That's right. And so, if I could, so Red Hawk, if I could offer uh, a third party characterization of your of your uh, expressed views. It's something like men should take these psychological insights and apply them to achieve their goals as they see fit, right? So you opened up with, you know, if men want to spin plates, they should act in X, Y, Z. They should take X, Y, Z kind of uh, actions. And if they want to do something else, they should use these insights in a different way. Is that a a fair assessment of, of what you would see in front of you? Yeah, um, more or less that is, um, you know, would summarize my position. Um, I think um, a big issue that I run into with a lot of people, um, particularly from the Christian crowd, and and this is like no shade or anything like that. It's just not really something that they uh, think about in such a way. They try to see the uh, red pill as um, like a philosophy or moral code to live by, and that's not what it is. It's um, it is a praxeology. It is a set of tools that, again, you have to be wise enough and have your own, uh, you know, mental point of origin to understand what tools uh, look best to you with whatever life that you want to live uh, for yourself. And I know that's uh, you know everyone's going to screech and read and say, oh, that sounds very leftist and very individualistic. And my response to that is what I said earlier about how you know uh, a man needs to make his own way uh, in the world. You know, and that's what I keep on pushing. I'm trying to speak to, you know, the kinds of, you know, higher intellect people in our circles uh, that definitely need and can use um, this kind of information to achieve, you know, the goals that they want from their lives. Yeah, which comes down to the the fundamental area of difference you're going to have with me and probably with most other Christians you're you're going to encounter. The question of do you have the right to make of your own life what it is you want to make of it? Um and so I would say that uh, we have a, like a hard prescription as men for what we for what we what our role is in society. Uh, we we're, we have a command given at the very beginning of Genesis to be fruitful and increase in numbers, to multiply and fill the whole earth, to subdue it and to rule and to reign in the earth. Um, and so that uh, vision cannot be. Uh, realized properly without proper family formation, which means y- you don't actually have the right to take a set of psychological insights about women and use them in order to do something besides form a family so that you can fulfill your God ordained purpose. Yeah, um, that sounds, um, you know, there's a much that I would agree with there. I mean, I do think that, um, you know, a healthy family is the um, you know, backbone to any society. Um, my objection just goes back to and just facing the facts that for 50% of men, that's simply not on the table. It's just not going to happen. Um, it takes two to tango. And if uh, women aren't going to be the ones, um, you know, to actually settle down and uh, marry people, you know, that sets a very, very bleak future um, for a lot of guys. A lot of guys checking out, a lot of guys, um, you know, sucks starting shotguns, as it were, you know. So it's just. I think my main uh, critique I have of the more traditionalist, um, you know, criticisms that I get is that so often it seems that um, instead of wanting solutions, uh, you guys want time machines. And, (laughs) um, and unfortunately, you know, I I very much agree that the, uh, you know, based and uh, tradcath Christian society where everyone has uh, good sexual uh, ethics and everything like that definitely makes for, you know, stable societies, but I just do not see that uh, returning uh, anytime soon. And I don't see that as being very actionable uh, advice for uh, the vast majority of men. 
Uh, although right. I would agree that the end state goal is definitely a noble one and one I would gladly live under. Um, you know, it just uh, seems so far away to me. Well, right. So there's a couple of reasons why it seems far away uh, to you, right? So if you look at... Um, so let's talk a little bit about the description of the situation here, because I, I think we'll find that the description of the situation that you're putting forward is a little bit different than the situation that uh, many traditionalist Christians kind of see in front of them. And we can talk a little bit about why that is. So if I've read your content properly, I would say that you identify a very, very large number of highly deracinated women pursuing hypergamous mating strategies outside of or in a, in a social uh, environment that promotes that behavior and pursuing hypergamous uh, sexual strategies both before and after marriage, uh, much to the dismay of, of many of the men who attempt to snare them in marriage. Is yeah. that a fair assessment of, of what I've seen? Um, for the most part, um, I would just, it seems like, um, I guess my only clarification would be, it seems like in that description, you're kind of describing hypergamy as kind of like something you do. Okay. Uh, yeah. Fair enough. Fair yeah, enough. Yeah. It's not really something you do. It just is like, it, it just is women's nature. And it's never going to change, you know? So it, it's, it's been with us from the beginning of time and will always be there. So, so it's not the fault of women to be a hypergamous. And this is why I take issue with a lot of like a uh, red meat, uh, kind of red pill content creators. And these tend to be the ones that get the most traction is, um, it's not, it's not the fault of uh, women to seek their best option. You know, so you shouldn't be hating on women. It doesn't serve you in any way. Uh, it's it's not it's not the problem. But one thing that I would say that is uh, deficient in this analysis uh, is that this analysis um, speaks to. Uh, so you're identifying a behavioral pattern that exists among a, a certain set of women. Uh, these All women. women but all, all women are hypergamous. Um, can of they? Of course, but the behavioral yeah. pattern of, of exercising hypergamy without social limits is a consequence of those women being uh, freed from the social shackles of shame, right? So if you look at a traditional society, what prevented women from uh, exercising the social strategy? Well, you opened up with the, the pill and it certainly it's the case that uh, both the economic success of our society and the technical capacity to control reproductive cycles uh, is an element of what's going on here. But another element of what's going on here is that women are extremely sensitive to peer group signaling, right? So if women exist in a peer group and family group that signals that uh, anti-monogamous behavior is acceptable, they're far more likely to engage in it. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And so uh, when you look at some of the critique you get from traditionalist Christians, you'll find that a lot of what they're referencing is a set of social conditions that do not exist in the broad culture, right? So, uh, when I married my wife, uh, one of the reasons why, um, so if I take my marriage at, at the moment, uh, if my marriage were to fall apart, the social repercussions for both parties would be catastrophic. Most of our relationships in our community would be over immediately. Uh, and there would be an extremely high degree of shame uh, associated with that. And that, I'd um, argue, I'd argue they'd be far worse um, for you, uh, no matter, you know, how based the uh, Christian, you know, denomination is. And um, you could. Yeah, basically, women are always gonna be cared for always, there will always be a simp, uh, there will always be somebody um, to uh, step up and, um, 
take care of them, protect them from uh, bad decisions. Uh, I agree that it would definitely be to a lesser extent in any you know uh, super based um, uh, you know Christian denomination. But uh, the guy is just always going to feel the the blunt of it, uh, and has done it, so historically. If I can inter- interject here, just to to, to come in, I, I think also the principal thing to to address here is that I think that Red Hawk has a point where it is the what the ideal should be and what has been lost. There was the yeah, of course, as, as, as Radlip had said, the sexual revolution did really start in the 1920s um, than it did in the 60s. It kind of had a pause because he had you know a war, but. Um, I, I think it's important to sort of also identify. I think most people in the chat, regardless of age, can kind of tell that the kids are not all right. I mean, yeah. For, for, yeah. For, for, for for men, right? Like Red Hawk and I, relatively, I think we're like a, there's a year difference in our age. Yeah. Um, and like I think we can both identify that a lot of men are despondent, and the last two years and a half did not help either with social skills, and that there's clearly been a, a radical change. Um, I, there's a through line really from the, the 1920s moving away from parents being sort of the matrimonial stakeholders to um, basically, you know, writing about Mr. Big and Sex in the City to today, swiping. Um, that well, that right. exists. That's th- re- and that through line is a through line of deracination, right? It's well, separating... that's, that's the point that I'm getting at is that it is deracination and that, that both men and women are going to approach that differently because we're wired differently. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of men, there's a growing number of men these days just aren't having sex anymore. There's a growing number of men that have pretty much checked out of everything. And I think we've seen that sort of devolve into three separate groups. I think one is the red pill sort of community, the Rolo Tomasi, the rational male types, a, a book that I picked up while I was in college. Um, I actually have read it, Red Hawk. So you can kind of, yeah. I, I kind of get where you're coming from most of the time. Um, two is the MGTOW types. And then three is incel. Like those are the big yeah. three that I really think have come out of like despondent men. The fourth, of course, and this, those are the three, the fourth, um, which sort of gives me the reassurance in, in part. And maybe this is where I, I, it's fun to play um, the, the sort of mediator here. Cause like I came from more of Red Hawks background. I definitely, uh, I, I definitely played the game. I, I spun plates. I dated, I have a body count that I'm not proud of, but like, that's me. Um, but then there's people that go the fourth way, which is usually this like return to tradition in some form or fashion, whether that's like return to monkey and double down, whatever they're doing, or they return to some kind of religious and spiritual practice. And I see well, that a I, lot. I, I wanted to highlight this because both my wife and I are examples of people who have reconstructed sexual ethics, right? Okay. So uh, neither of us were raised in families that were deeply ingrained in religious communities. Both of us, by the time we were 15, had deeply ingrained ourselves in religious communities as a consequence of constructing a sexual ethic out of nothing, right? Uh, not from our so you parents found, having... So you found religion on your own? That's right. Well, and not just that, but found a particular type on our own. Uh, and the, the reason I reference this is that I think that the people who are going to make it through this period are the people who are able to uh, construct a sexual ethic that is viable for reproduction uh, out of the ashes of, of, you know, what they're given, right? You can actually opt into uh, a community that, um, you can actually opt into a community with with a, a constructed sexual ethic. You don't, it does not have to be uh, a part of your identity that you were born into right so, so here here would be my question then um because this is also something that i i i should probably I've, I've been pondering myself on this issue is is that um in that regard do you think that you can in, in i guess what's the phrase can you save everybody would be the the, the question um because like yeah there's a lot of people that are like you or myself that will have some sort of you know uh, come to jesus meeting so to speak and have that moment and begin to find themselves to towards a an ethic or a tradition or a lifestyle or in this instance you know a a church and a particular religion a little bit of both right yeah Yeah. a little bit yeah right like you know you you found yourself in the reformed baptist community i found myself within the orthodox church yet there's not many people that would i would argue have that capability or like like red hawk had said well this is a minority type deal look the the reality is the overwhelming majority of people are not capable of seeing outside of the culture in which they were born. 
Mm -hmm. uh, this is true with regard to sexual ethics. It's also true with regard to many other things. And uh, those people, it's not valuable to speak to for uh, from a, the perspective of a, a stream like this. Uh, if you're, you're not capable of uh, dispassionately evaluating the culture into which you were raised and uh, choosing to reconstruct it according to your own, according to the evaluation that that you come to, uh, I can't help you. Red Hawk can't help you. Mm -hmm. um, so if I no may, uh, if I may come in here, I've got um, so two things. Um, I'll uh, I'll respond to this. Um, first off, is um, okay. So let's say that um, uh, I've been fleshing this idea out um, uh, recently, and I was actually talking to Paul Fahrenheit about this over the weekend. Um, so basically what we have with um christian um you know sexual uh, morality and stuff like that is that um you know uh stay chaste uh before marriage now the main way that uh historically men would uh attract women to them is more of the beta buck side of provisioning because women can uh provide for themselves now i've kind of coined this like um economically viable i guess would be the right term for it so yeah. pre-industrial revolution what was like the time frame from puberty to a man being economically viable? It was only like a year or two years, you know, like you, you your balls drop at 16, you could build a farm, you know, around like 17 or 18, you can have a, a woman and you could be economically viable. Yeah. Although if you look at that time period, it was very common for much older men to marry young women. Well, yeah, I'm getting that too in a, in a second here. Um, my, and here comes uh, the next point about this is that today, for uh, men to be uh, economically viable, uh, you're looking well into your 30s in most cases. Um, you know, particularly for the millennials and Zoomers who are pretty much all across the board unable to own homes, um, you know, because of the economic conditions and all that kind of stuff. So I see this as a complete losing battle to have pr a man for quite literally his entire adult life uh, just decide to be. Um, you know, uh, chaste. I think you're fighting with one of the strongest um, urges to get that gets men up in the morning. You know, is to go and yep. have sex and to go and get women. And if you're telling them that uh, you, you know, have to wait for all this kind of stuff, ah, oh, for fuck's sake. Hold on. There we go. God damn it. Fucking Discord. Uh, carry on. Yeah. So to answer the question, I'll answer the question in kind of a, a threefold way. Uh, first of all. Uh, one of the benefits of modernity that is under underappreciated is that the quality of human capital with which you're competing economically is extremely poor. So if you don't carry this sort of what I call the degeneracy load, um, the psychological and physical load of uh, carrying the um, consequences of modernity around with you as a young man, you'll have a huge economic advantage uh, over all of the people with whom you're competing. So that that's bonus. That's issue number one, right? So if you don't imbibe the lies that are culturally ubiquitous, there's a huge, huge advantage to you as a young man economically in, in sort of understanding that. Well, item still, number two you're still going to have to wait and hang on a long time compared let me to let me make my three let me yeah, make sure. my points and then we'll come back to it so item number two is that women as we discussed at the beginning of this uh when we were discussing the diagnosis choose men based on their position in male dominance hierarchies uh which means that your economic success in the eyes of women around you is measured relative to the other men that she considers viable mating candidates. So you don't necessarily have to be economically successful compared to your father. You have to be economically successful compared with all the other men that she sees as viable candidates. So the idea that you're not self-sufficient because you aren't economically successful compared to your boomer parents or whatever, is it's the wrong lens through which to see your economic prospects. Um, most successful marriages uh, of most people begin in quite humble economic circumstances. Uh, you know, I, I was 
my wife and I were married when I was 23 and she was 21. And, you know, uh, I was very fortunate to be extremely economically successful early in my life. But even at that, at 23, I wasn't that economically successful. But, you know, I looked awfully good compared to my peers at the time, I suppose. Um, so th that's that's item number two. And item number three is... Um, so there's the pure economic element of economic success. And then there's the, there, men take on a certain affectation when they believe that they've had success in dominance hierarchies. Um, and that affectation depends on your self-perception. So the view that a lot of young men take that they're not, that they they're not economically successful in comparison to the standards that they've seen you know either in media or in other generations i think it's a really negative effect on them because psychologically they're representing themselves as failures uh before before women and that's that's a huge tax on them as well so i think there's some reasons to be optimistic that uh even in a pretty negative climate uh, you, you can probably have some success uh there in positioning yourself as an economically successful man all that said um there's still going to be a significant number of men who are not able to have enough success to attract uh, a viable mate in their early 20s and it's a, a really difficult thing to uh know what to do with these what to do with these men and it actually comes back to one of your one of the interesting prescriptions that you you put out there so if i've read your pieces correctly you argue that actually part of these men becoming you know becoming worthy so to speak is going out and uh having going out and um how do how do, how do i put it going out and uh enjoying the fruits of the broad culture's sort of poor sexual ethic is that a, a fair characterization um yeah uh for two reasons i mean number one yes it absolutely is enjoyable and i'm not gonna go out and make such a ridiculous statement as to, that it's not you know because obviously you know uh, sex is fun everyone enjoys it you know uh, but the second part about it is just the practical implications of it that if you are like the guy that goes nose to the grindstone and does decide to participate in uh, this game, however rigged it is, and it absolutely is rigged, but if you do want to participate in it and you go hardcore, you need to be on your absolute A game. And that does require, in my opinion, to be red pill aware. And a very large part of being red pill aware is being sexually experienced with women. Um, so this is this is an interesting perspective, right? being red pill aware requires being sexually experienced with women in, in your view is that correct um i yes i mean there's definitely some very edge cases where you could avoid it um but i think for for the vast majority of people you do absolutely need to um you know uh be be experienced on this front red um, hawk would you say the edge cases would be perhaps black horse's position where both he and his wife were virgins before marriage yeah yeah okay. that's kind of what i would uh point that as um not so much like on the uh, man side of things um but uh like a yeah definitely um a woman being um you know the virgin so to speak is definitely more of the edge case here than than the guys because sex just affects men and women differently you know and that's not remotely controversial to say yeah I, I mean this is interesting because one of the real points of difference that i i have with what i see in some of your content is uh, you you take this you take a view uh, and i i don't want to mischaracterize you but you appear to take a view that uh diverse sexual experience is actually positive for the male character um so do you want to flush out that argument a little bit rather than have me kind of uh characterize it right um yeah i'll do that first i wanted to um i jotted down a couple notes here when you were making those uh three points earlier and i sure. uh, want to address those really quick yeah sure um so you were mentioning about um men being you know uh economically um uh 
uh, viable just for the people that uh, the woman has uh, access to. Um, this has become, uh, this is also like a really big uh, gap, even, you know, I mean, Black Horse just in the 10 years, you know, and yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, this is a huge gap. 75% of uh, relationships start online now, and it's um, sexual marketplace is global at this point. So regardless of if um, the woman's like actual geographic area limits her to a certain caliber of men, it's come to the point where the propaganda and the swiping culture and the Instagram culture and everything has gotten to the point where uh, any of the, the women's standards are so exceedingly high and anyone who's on like any dating apps uh, will totally see this. Yeah. That I mean, it's it, the, it's I not just, you're not, anyone, you're not competing would, with the guy down the street anymore. You're competing with, you know, the entire country. Yeah. But I would say that like any woman who's been on a dating app is not a candidate for marriage. Uh, I, I, I actually t uh, vehemently disagree with this um, uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, I do find, and like I was saying, and this is becoming more and more uh, common on the apps over the last two years because of the COOF, um, you actually are finding a lot of, we would call it more uh, traditional uh, girls on these uh, sites and stuff like that. I'm not sure like uh, what kind of success they are having and the kinds of guys that they're looking for. But they uh, absolutely are uh, out there, and I've yeah, uh, I've, I've, I've seen met, it. But I've, this is like I've an met quite a few of them, and I've had quite a few of them as plates within the last couple of years, and two of them would have made fantastic wives. But it's just um, yeah, you know, if they were letting you spend them as yeah. plates, they wouldn't have made fantastic wives. Ah, uh, see, I, I I disagree with this. Um, uh, just because it's you know the woman adapts to um the man uh basically, and it's like. Yeah, but if she's adapted, we're going to go, in, she we're going to go into a lot of. <laughs> this is going to derail the conversation. Well, no, 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 no. Well, yeah, let, let's, with this. Let, yeah, let's, yeah. let's ask it as this question because let, let's go back to the notes so we can keep it on track. Because this was a this was a part of the points of difference that Black Horse had wrote down for this discussion that I thought was a good thing that we should discuss was, um, you know, the like you said, sex affects men and women differently. I think that all three of us can agree with that. We've all had that happen to us before. We're either well, maybe not Black Horse because he's married, but Red Hawk and I can probably say that we've had our own encounters and differences with women where it feels differently with one person to it does to another. Not just the act itself, but just like how it feels afterwards. yeah no it, it yeah. has yeah. Yeah. such a different yeah. psychological effect that's exactly it, it affects men and women differently so i thought that that would be a, a good point for us to discuss which is you know what does promiscuity do to men and uh i think that, that would be a good point to to bring out and this would be uh you know if we want as red hawks you know surmises that you know men should be experienced um rather than perhaps the edge case which used to be the norm i would argue um historically as red uh, black horse provides as his own living proof and experience here you know what what impact is that going to be because the question i think that lies in is if we want to move towards a metric of a healthier society you know we have to also address what are those social consequences what are the the social consequences of of a promiscuous man and what are the social consequences of moving towards the society that should be civilizationally healthy marriage, children, birth rates, et cetera, um, with where the prescription is Red Hawk, not to, you know, do you dirty and correct me if I'm wrong, is about having at least some notches under the belt. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I think the, um, the positives far outweigh the negatives as it relates to a man, uh, as it relates to a woman, um, I would, strongly recommend that a woman keeps her body count as absolutely low as possible however uh, if we look at the data these days the average woman in her uh, late 20s has double to triple the body count of the same man her own age so uh, it's not looking great on that front but uh you know it's definitely something we should be encouraging and uh you know heading towards but you know I'd... right i mean there's a pareto distribution of body count among men that that's obviously the case yeah um but the, well it's also the question like that still with stands, women like it's also like that with women on dating apps like there have been numerous studies that say that men will rate uh, women on dating apps according to a bell curve and men and women are like the exact opposite where like 80 percent of men are not attractive at all yeah in, like the top that's 20. right men are pareto distributed for sexual access women are bell distributed right uh is a fundamental difference in the way that th that's why in if you look at surveys women 
have much higher body counts than men. And then there are obviously some men who have extremely high body counts. But the question remains, like, what is the psychological effect of promiscuity among men on men? Well, um, we don't really have um, much to say on this because there's so few of them and, uh, uh, you know, they're very rare. I mean, a lot of people like to point to figures like uh, Rouge V. I know he's very, very popular um, in these kinds of circles as kind of like the prodigal son, uh, the guy that um, took down <laughs> the guy that took down all of his, um, you know, uh, pickup books from his website and renounced his uh, evil ways and uh, came back to the church. Um, whether his conversion is genuine or not, that's not for me to say. Um, but you know, I, I just, it, it's tough for us to decide because we really don't have, uh, the kind of data that we do, um, for the women, because there are so few guys. I mean, I'm, I'm more inclined to, uh, say that it just doesn't affect them in the same uh, way because we don't see, you know, large like antidepressant use and um all these other kinds of things like um from guys are way at the top i mean but this might be something we see in the next like 20 to 30 years when like a bunch of like uh rich like athletes and rappers and stuff like that you know are um you know without kids and stuff like that but for now we just don't really have this well, well let, let, i mean let's i would acknowledge argue... black horse hold on let, yeah. let's acknowledge clearly like in this discussion right like this is going to be somewhat anecdotal one in part because black horse i I, let's, I I feel like it needs to be said you are kind of a minority at least for a lot of yeah, guys in the yeah. west and like we're not going to really like in red hawk is also right like we're not going to have i think perhaps the data points at least right in front of us to, to acknowledge this yeah. so i think it's important that this conversation is going to be on an anecdote part black right. horse you come from like the most adamant traditionally minded like you and your wife met each other you guys were virgins beforehand. You guys are in a tight-knit religious community. Unfortunately, in my perspective, that's a minority, and that's unfortunately yeah, it's that, that's, extremely. It's an extreme minority. An extreme minority, but also depressing. Red Hawk. True. I mean, we I agree. You, we we know that we we kind of know who you are, right? Like spun plates. And the reason why I think this is actually kind of nice that we're hosting the conversation here. Um, there's, I wrote this Substack like over almost a, a year ago now. It's called Chased. I used to spin plates. I used to do all these things. I have a body count of over twenty-seven. Um, I don't do it anymore. Uh, my come to Jesus meeting, the coof being on dialysis kind of hampers your dating prospects and kind of makes you reassess things when you face your mortality. Mm. I think that it is an interesting part here to have the anecdotal bit about what promiscuity does to men um, because you kind of do get two different pathways, I think. And I could be wrong. There are there could be more than one. You do have perhaps the Red Hawk side where, you know, how I think you've said it before, right? Enjoy the decline. Yeah, um, whereas, so. yeah, right. Whereas... There is the the Roosh V type deal where there are some that it's like, well, maybe we should come back to, to something different, um, which, you know, for me, that's definitely something the case. I can't speak for Roosh yeah. V. I do think that his return to Christianity is a little more authentic. But uh, for me, what I can I tend say, to, I tend to disagree, but I'll let you finish. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Well, again, that <laughs> could be its own separate thing. Right. But right. Um, uh, the, anyways, the, the point I'm trying to make here is at least on an anecdotal experience, um, you know, the, the impact of promiscuity that does to men uh, in, in this point is just that it reminds me of a post that uh, Frody of all people had made. I think he had put out a poll asking what would be like the dead set bottom line body count on a woman that you would accept for marriage. And I think it was like five or less. Um, as for men, it often gets overlooked, but at least in my perspective, like, yeah, it's fun to go around and to get your rocks off and whatnot. But like, um, you know, I, I kind of find myself looking at it sort of like the guy from company where it's just like, well, it's nice and all and the, the dating life is great. But at the same time, it would also be nice to um, be in the what we long for. Like you'd said at the beginning, I sort of recognize that the the way things are now are not what i'm psychologically developed for and i think a lot of men like red hawk has also said come despondent but that's just my perspective and i'm getting it out here because we're trying to acknowledge things in an anecdotal sense because we don't have the data points right yeah um, i mean i i would make a comment here before we go on so in addition to you know my own personal experience uh in the professional world i'm ex i'm exposed to a lot of very very high status men many of whom have quite significant body counts for a variety of reasons. Uh, these are men who, you know, tend to accumulate body counts later in life because they've 
made a, a great deal of money. And my impression is that uh, just like body counts impair a woman's ability to genuinely pair bond, uh, body counts, I wouldn't say that the effect is as prof profound or as immediate, but they definitely affect a man's ability to pair bond. Uh, yeah, I could definitely speak to this um, a little bit. And um, uh, Prude, we definitely had uh, discussions about this too. It's, um, yeah, like uh, playing the game for a long time does um, uh, numb you, like to the majesty and the mystique of uh, of women. Um, you know, uh, it absolutely does do this. Um, so that that's element number one. And element number two is that uh, any woman and any father protecting her, his daughter is going to look at you completely differently if he knows you have a body count yeah uh, that comes from you know <sighs> because be what honest, they're going what they're going to do is they're going to assume you've not adopted the same set of social constraints that they've adopted right you cannot you cannot without radical um repentance enter into a community like that and construct a marriage with the same kind of social stigmas against uh, divorce and promiscuity while having a promiscuous history see i'm not i'm not entirely convinced um by that just simply because uh in my experience it's it's kind of like just um it's like you'd rather have your daughter with um an alpha male guy than with like a sneaky male feminist you know like you'd um you'd ra there's almost like a kind of like unspoken respect there like if you just own who you are in my experience you, you get along pretty well with even the most based uh conservative like father figure i mean well, they might not necessarily you know do, like approve but you know you get a couple beers in your system and like when men talk you know men talk you know it's i i mean personally i've never had an issue with it i mean i'm sure but then again i'm not you know dating you know reformed baptists and stuff i'm just you know you know catholics and stuff but you know um so i mean i i'm sure there definitely are um you know fathers that are like that and stuff in my experience it hasn't really been an issue just because of you know the pools of men that are out there these days it's just refreshing to be like oh wow this guy is fit and he actually knows what he's talking about and knows how to carry in conversation and you know isn't you know complete soy boy so but that's uh that's just my opinion on that so I think the other thing to also point out is is that there is also just not a homogenous uh, tradition that exists. I mean, um, just in part because it, things have gotten so fractured the way that they are, whether it's both in terms of religion or just what the, you know, I guess the secular appropriate moral, you know, norms or mores are these days as well. That's right. So which actually comes to the next piece of my outline which is the question of, uh, so like one of the things that was said to me when I was a young man that transformed my perspective on, on dating uh, what was a, like an offhanded comment from my father, uh, reference sort of self-congratulating himself on his choice of a wife because of what a great mother she made. Uh, and it was the first time, you know, me at 15, had considered the fact that uh, that dating is not just about satisfying your sort of immediate desires. It's also about selecting somebody who will be an excellent and mother in the middle of their life, who will be you know an excellent grandmother later on in their life. Uh, somebody who you can have a life with that is you know filled with joy, right? Uh, and so um, in, in my outline, I wrote this out as like what when when choosing a woman as a wife, what role should participation in the common religious community uh, and a common religious meta narrative play, intellectual agreement, these kinds of different things. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely clear on your perspective on this Red Hawk. So why don't mm -hmm. you uh, lay out your view here? Right. So uh, I think there's there's another thing to uh, clarify here as well. Um, basically, like uh, when I uh, I mean, one of my flagship uh, terms I use all the time is enjoy the decline. And a lot of people misconstrue this as 
you know, oh, you should just be completely hedonistic and degenerate and, you know, because the world is crumbling around you and there's nothing you could do about it. And therefore, you know, just uh, pursue any desire that you should have. And that's not uh, what it is at all. Basically, what it what enjoy the decline, uh, and this is in uh, Aaron Clary's book, Enjoy the Decline, which you guys should all go and read. It's a fantastic book. Um, it's basically acknowledging the fact of the realities on the ground that we simply, this isn't our time. Uh, we weren't born uh, in this time. We weren't born in this, um, you know, uh, based Christian time where you could just walk down the street and your woman would be a virgin. She'd be attractive. She'd respect your male authority and all this kind of stuff. Uh, it's not our time. And you can sit back and you can sulk about that, or you can actually take action and increase your probabilities as best you know you possibly can. So uh, go be fit, go um, you know uh, make your money, go live your life uh, the best you can. And if uh, the right woman comes along, absolutely uh, take advantage of that because a good woman is uh, quite frankly you know priceless. Uh, but it's just acknowledging the fact that you don't have any control over this situation. You really don't. As a man in the West, um, you have no control over, you know, what the women your age are doing, what the ones that are coming in the future, are they going to settle down? Are they going to be good mother figures? You really, you know, it's it's basically going to be luck of the draw at this point, you know, so enjoy it as uh, best you can. And then if it comes around while you're increasing your chances, then absolutely take advantage of that. But, you know, don't put all your, uh, you know, um, money backing this one horse that probably isn't going to come in first for you. Let me try to unpack that for a minute. Mm. So uh, when you say don't put all your money behind this one horse, that's probably not going to come in for you. What you're, what you're saying there is that uh, it's unlikely that you'll find success uh, with a mating strategy targeted to identify uh, a woman who will make a good mother and permanent partner for you well it's not necessarily that it's that that most women in the west don't want to be moms um or would make of course but uh, of course but and there's nothing you can do to change that right but most men in the west aren't looking to pair bond either so like I just dis- I disagree with that actually. I think uh, the vast majority of uh, men in the West would gladly uh, settle down uh, uh, with one woman and would absolutely be um, good providers for them, but uh, they just simply can't because they've been cut out of uh, hypergamy. Um, well, I, I would I would push back a bit considering the fact that I think for a lot of men that aren't raised in some kind of like really traditionally minded sexual ethic, what is the first thing that a lot of guys are taught is like both by society, but also by like general dating and whatnot is, is that basically the consequences of pair bonding or having a child as a consequence of sex, which the natural consequence of sex is, you know, you're supposed to be making a baby is like the worst possible thing that could ever happen to you, especially as a young man. Not only that, but like, have you seen 25 year old men out there? They're pieces of garbage who uh, like are completely unfocused on building a life for themselves no i agree yeah men uh, are despondent and they have uh you know very much very little to look forward to and very little to you know uh live for currently in the west uh that's probably a harsh word but they they have um you know uh, most men are checking out they're despondent they're playing video games they're but they're weed, like they're they're, they're checking out from 14 and then they're complaining about it at 25 because they checked out from 14 no, I mean, I, I, I mean, I agree that um, most guys should absolutely be, you know, striving for better and everything like that. But striving for better doesn't uh, fix the women. Um, so, society needs to fundamentally change uh, for the women to be fixed. But you, you can my, absolutely my, change my point them of view to is some basic, degree. My point but, of view is basically that, like, there's such a a large layer of sludge on the bottom. You should be able to rise above that. Yeah, yeah, you absolutely can. That's part of uh, my concept that I uh, tell to people all the time is that it's easier than ever to be a top 20% man. It absolutely is. However, does that mean there's top 20% women to go around? There really aren't. Um, now, that's not an excuse for you to, you know, just completely unplug from things and, you know, be 400 pounds and, uh, you know, weed and stay on welfare and stuff like that. You know, I mean, hey, it's, it's your life and you can waste it if you want to. Uh, I wouldn't encourage it. But Again, my my point comes again. Back. Fundamental point of disagreement. It's not your life, and you have no right to waste it. Well, I mean, 
I mean, you and <laughs> Sorry, I. Sorry, fundamental have... point of, no, of disagreement I, I, here, but I, it needs to be I drawn guess, out. I guess we're kind of we're kind of we're, we're talking past each other. My point being is like I'm not the king over somebody else. I've got more important things to be worried about than what that guy is doing uh, with his own life. And whether you know God says that it's not his life for him to do what he says fit, that's also between him and God. It has nothing to do with me because I can't I can't control that. You know, so I can't force a guy to go live his best life and God can't force a guy to live his best life. Only he can l choose to live his best life. You know, yeah. so it's kind of a moot point for me to uh, stress out about, you know, his everyday goings on. That's that's what he's got to do. My my. So here's the point that I would maybe ask in rejoinder to Red Hawk then would be in, in this regard. Right. Like if, with how things are, we definitely can acknowledge that things are not the way that they should be and that things are for lack of a better term, things are pretty fucked and that. You know, we, we, we do put a lot of, like you just said, it, it does take up on the guy. You, you've mentioned agency and whatnot. But if you're offering this praxology, does this praxology not kind of incentivize the sort of issues that we identified at the beginning that we agree on as problems? Hmm. I mean, hold on. I got caught reading the chat, Peru, to rephrase. <laughs> <laughs> i know i know i broke the rules you uh motherfucker. i know okay let me rephrase it then or I'll, I'll repeat myself considering like you had mentioned earlier that this does have a lot as well on men and that you can't command them and whatnot and and so on um women are also the same way yes men and women are wired differently we've both acknowledged that and agreed um the the point that i would i'm trying to make to you then is this question is that is the praxology, because you have said that this is a praxology, this is a set of tools, that does this praxology not only kind of act as an incentivizing tool for the current issues that we have with women? Um, to an extent, um, I, I've made this argument before. Um, there are so few uh, unplugged, like uh, red pill guys out there that are uh, spinning plates and everything like that. I would argue that their effect on the culture is minuscule compared yeah, to think, the issues of is the welfare fair. state uh feminism you know industrial revolution all these other things um i would absolutely agree with the statement that not every single guy can or should uh be out there um uh, spinning plates and uh, not settling down it does not lead to a healthy society at all no um but again like we we share the same end common goals but it's just well, I think it's fair that that uh, you know pickup artists are not the driving force by any stretch of the imagination in the um, in the the cultural decline, right? But the the comment that I would have is, how does this life strategy map on map to success at 40, 60, 80 for you as a man? Well, um, I mean, ideally, again, like and in. And end state goal for me is indeed having, um, you know, a wife and family and children. It absolutely right. is. It so is something how does what like you're doing it. now lead to that? Well, what, how it leads to is the fact that, you know, in my current state, I mean, I do pretty well for myself, but I'm still not, you know, comfortable enough at this point that I would want to be supporting, um, you know, wife and uh, uh, children, stuff like that. I'd, um, you know, and also, you know, uh, my game still needs polishing as good as it is. Um, I've definitely switched um, tactics over the last, and I was talking to Paul about this too over the weekend. I've definitely been switching more from uh, the pickup scene and spinning plates to try and get into more like uh, LTR stuff. Cause I'm not going to lie. It is a bit, it is a part of my game that is um, lacking. Um, you know, for the longest time I would just, you know, spin pretty quickly and, you know, be done with it. So it is something I'm trying to shift towards um, now, you know, because as I mentioned before, uh, the game does, you know, it, it is taxing and it takes a lot of the majesty and the mystique out of you. It's like, oh, okay, so we're going to this bar again and we're talking about the same things again and uh, we're using the same one-liners again and, uh, you know, oh, so we're going back and doing this thing now, like the last, you know, 15 times before, you know, and stuff like that. So uh, ideally, you know, everything that I'm doing is to secure uh, my future for, you know, finance wise, fitness wise, game wise, you know, frame wise, all that stuff to lead to the most successful life that I want to live. 
And if I find a uh, good woman that steps into my frame, I will absolutely uh, rejoice in that and would love being a father. But I also acknowledge and understand the fact that if that does not come, because it really isn't in my control because of the crop of women that we're dealing with in the West currently, uh, I'm not going to sit back and say that my life was wasted because I wasn't you know, a father and I never got married. No, it's something I would like to have and I would love to have that. But I also, I just understand the, I understand the facts on the ground, you know? Yeah. I mean, my question would be, how is it that what you're doing now makes yourself ready for the hypothetical good woman to come along? Mm, yeah. Just understanding, um, you know, a lot of the uh, lies that are taught about the uh, female nature and everything like that, you know, uh, how to pass shit tests, how to keep women around how to, you know, deal with, you know, crisis scenarios and stuff like that. And, you know, I think, uh, I think another part of this as well is, um, you know, in the realm of anecdotes, um, you know, uh, I came from a divorced family, you know, and I definitely don't want to go through, uh, any of that, you know, so that's another, um, uh, piece of this you now, but understanding, um, uh, female nature is absolutely, uh, a requirement. And also, like I mentioned before, it, it also is enjoyable you know, as well. And I, I'm not going to deny and say that's not part of this as well, you know? I'm trying, I'm trying to word my question or maybe my point to continue the discussion in a way that doesn't sound smarmy to either of you. Um, <laughs> it's all right. I have broad shoulders. <laughs> well, good to know. Um, so I, here's something that I guess that comes to my mind then is, is that I think, that if your if your strategy for this to to sort of play this playing the game, I, it's a phrase even I don't like, despite the fact that I've, I I say it. Um, I mean, it's not it's logistically only possible, right? In in these current set of standards, um, we you know birth control, the 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 status of how women operate in. Um, my I guess here would be my question: is is that do you find this praxology relevant or viable to achieve what, you know, we kind of agree to be the, um, the, the end goal here? Like, uh, if you think that this is going to somehow maximize your chance at finding a wife, um, you know, if, if you're, if that's the, what you're aiming for, um, do you, do you see this strategy based on either a, your experience or B your interactions with other, like the red pill PUA types does this work for getting them to find wives? Cause to me, it seems like this is just a really great way to get my dick wet and nothing more. Um, again, it depends on uh, what your goals are. A lot of the top uh, dog manosphere guys uh, are married. Um, Roll Tomasi, Ryan stone, um, uh, John MLD. He has a long-term relationship right now. Um, so uh, rich Cooper, you know, he also has a long-term, I mean, they don't get married. Uh, they have like long-term relationships because you know, they understand the divorce courts and everything like that. But a lot of the top dogs of the manosphere do have quote unquote wives that they've, that they've been with for significant periods of their lives. No, so uh, well, I mean, the reality is, once you have children with a woman, with a woman, you're you're stuck with them forever. It doesn't matter whether you have something written on a piece of paper or not. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true as well. But yeah, like it, I do think there definitely does come a point in a man's life where he wants to settle down. I do think it's very rare to find, um, you know, the bachelor guy in his fifties that still wants to go out uh, clubbing and stuff like that. I I do think that's extremely rare. Um. But again, it's it's just a it's an analysis of, you know, the state of play of the board, basically. Um, and this is in my experience and in the experience of many other guys, this is just how you maximize your opportunity. And I reject kind of the, oh, you can just join a base church um, because if if the you know, if the attractive Christian virgin women were there in the churches, men would be there in droves. Uh, in joining them, you know, men, we, we we've got our agents everywhere, you know. So if if they were there in these, uh, you know, massive numbers, then there would be guys flocking to the churches in massive numbers to pick up these chicks. And I don't see that happening. I'm sure there definitely are some out there and everything like that. There absolutely are, but I, I just don't don't think it's. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a dynamic feasible. you probably have not seen because it would be very difficult for you to have seen it. So like every couple of weeks at a 
uh, a conservative church somewhere in this country, there there's a group of men who come in in an attempt to pair, in an attempt to pair off with the young women of that that church. Uh, these women wash out, or these men wash out of that church within like four months, because they realize that none of the women there will pair with them without like years long investment. Uh, because as soon as because they're they're signaling that they like for these women pairing with a, a man who is not uh, radically and unconditionally religiously committed is verboten. And if you show up at a church and four months later you're trying to date her, you've signaled that the reason you're there is to pair up with women, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. And you have to be incredibly stupid not to see that. Yeah, so my, these women are are totally walled off from from like if I look at the context in in Toronto, it's actually not uncommon to see uh, like thirty five or forty year old leftover women in churches because of the uh, because churches are more more female than male in, in this this context well well and, is that like a good recipe then for like <laughs> saying that this is like uh working yeah uh, I, <laughs> I mean i'm suggesting to you that uh that there are opportunities uh, so what am i suggesting to you i ain't marrying a 40 year old spinster <laughs> what i'm <laughs> suggesting to you is that um the what am i suggesting to you what i'm suggesting to you is that uh, the reason why this is not working is not uh, I'm suggesting to you that there are communities with problems other than the problems of the broad culture. That's what I'm suggesting to you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> we can pretty much all agree that, you know, in, in the ashes, you know, nothing is left unscathed, you know. Every, yeah, that, I think uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, I mean, there absolutely are um, uh, problems everywhere um you know with stuff like this and you know i mean nobody's got all the right answers you yeah. know uh unfortunately so the the one other thing that i wanted to address that came out of chat is this comment that i'm telling men to, to pull themselves up by the bootstraps um you know th th there's kind of two elements to this first of all uh yes i think there's i think that young men overwhelmingly underestimate what success they can have if they uh try uh on the other hand uh, my comment is not that uh this is some path that you can easily tread my comment is that there is no other path that's worth treading um so my view would be that the uh future of quote spinning plates is not a future worth having and so uh you know well so you, also so it? is sure. yes i mean but, so is also you know um you know getting into a sexless marriage or or a divorce or you know uh being single and make you know i mean like there there's far worse options um out there that are becoming you know more increasingly common uh by the day again like we definitely share uh the same uh end state goals here i'm just very skeptical that um you know the, the christian framework is you know applicable to uh most people uh throughout the west i i just don't think it is uh, it'd be well, fantastic if think, it was i also but... think it's one of the things that, like you can't you can't casually opt into it right you have to make a radical commitment in order to right even uh and it you you can't adopt it as a mating strategy which is really what i was trying to get at before like you can't adopt a religious frame as a mating strategy. People see right through it immediately. Yeah. Uh, my only objection to that would be like, I think it would be wise if, um, you know, the churches were to uh, lean into that um, because at the end of the day, it really is the number one driver uh, for men. I feel like, and this is just my personal thoughts. I feel like men come to uh, religiousness and spirituality largely later in life. Uh, after, you know, they've uh, settled down and they have time after covering, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, they actually have time to settle down and think more about the spiritual kind of stuff. I think it's um, 
like the best relationships I've seen with this kind of stuff in my own personal experience is when uh, the man um, marries a younger woman and the woman is kind of like irreligious, but not, you know, whorish. And then the guy returns to the church and brings the woman along with him. I, it, it seems weird to me to, um, I don't know, like um, have like this hyper, super religious girl. And then the guy is like qualifying to her based on like how, you know, great he is at following Jesus. It, it seems to me like the comparison for the relationship is God then, which is an insurmountable person to compare yourself to. That's how it's been in my experience dating like very, you know, uh, uh, hardcore religious girls. I mean, I came from a, a religious background, stuff like that. I mean, I've kind of, you know, fallen away from it for my own personal reasons, but that's just the way I see these things. And I could be wrong, but that's just, you know, um, my own personal experience with this kind of stuff. I'd be interested if uh, what, what you guys think about that, particularly about like a guy settling down into a phase like later in life and then bringing, um, you know, someone along uh, with Well, him. I mean, one of the obvious reasons why that works as well as it does is because it, it's a man leading his wife toward a religious frame and, and leading your wife in worship in the home is like the proper function of a man. Right. One of the really awful things that you see in a lot of poorly constructed religious communities is you see this phenomena where like uh, where the mother is the like dominant religious conveyor in the, the family. And mm, I've seen that, too. Yeah, it's it's very, very common in the United States right now. And it's it's quite dysfunctional. Um, it, it's very undercutting to the, the husband and father's role in the family. Uh, it's an abdication of responsibility and it, it, it leads to abdications of responsibility in, in other places and it leads to undermining of his authority. It's, it's not good. Um, yeah. I also find most churches to be very feminine. Uh, these days and uh, we got father's day coming up and i can guarantee you on the you know homily and uh, all the catholic masses you'll be hearing all about how uh, men need to uh, man up and they are um, you know responsible for all the issues um, in society and uh, look to uh, you know the goddess woman uh, to you know be the worship at the feet of and that, that's you know my own personal experience with this kind of stuff and i know a lot of i know a lot of guys share the same thoughts on that yeah i i mean it's, we basically we, we've got fucked up guys and we've got fucked up women in modernity you know yeah it, it, it's cert <laughs> so, that's certainly the case yeah yeah absolutely so i know uh prude wanted to get out of here in an hour and a half is there anything prude you want to cover before we get closed uh we've got a little more time we'll be fine um this this went a lot better than i thought it would be um but them's fighting words <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it did go better than i thought it would be which i'm I'm very happy for but i mean i i, I had mentioned in the in the description sort of a, a a christian uh ethic on on marriage which i don't feel i i felt like it was this had been more so just a uh maybe a discussion more so than it was uh perhaps a focus on what the Christian ethic is saying in, in part. Well, and that's always also a really loaded question because the Christian ethic, it just depends yeah. on what type of Christian that you ask. Yeah. So, I mean, I did a series on this with, with, uh, Lamb. Well, I did a series on the role of women, uh, in the family with Lambda on, on Lambda Bible studies. So you can check that out. And there's a series on the role of men that were in the process of constructing, but at a 30,000 foot level, I mean, the, uh, Christian sexual ethic is, uh, well, l let me lay out the traditional pattern here, and this will this applies across denominations broadly. Uh, that uh, men, uh, or that boys grow in, boys are allowed to participate in courtship when they've grown into men on, and are able to. Uh, support themselves economically and are able to uh, stand on their own feet socially and religiously that uh, men and women uh, pair off with substantial parental involvement so it would be typical in traditional christian communities for uh, a, a man to approach a woman's father in order to ask permission to date her 
uh, after to spend a period uh, dating in you know relatively public settings, and then to after a, an appropriate period of getting to know each other, uh, ask the father and then ask the woman to marry them and to have uh, a marriage which is a function of the community as a whole, then it becomes the responsibility of the community to socially enforce the expectations on both parties of, of that they fulfill their, their role inside the marriage. The man as the spiritual leader of the family and as the uh, primary provider and the woman as in submission to her husband, uh, busy at home and not, um, and not uh engaged in uh, many of the archetypal sins of women gossip etc uh looking outside the authority of her husband um etc so that that that's and that 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 her focus becomes her children uh and you know grandchildren eventually uh for for the rest of of their life together and that would be the pattern that has existed across virtually all denominations for like 1500 years and has completely collapsed in the last hundred in most churches. Black horse, don't you know that's misogyny? Come on. <laughs> yeah. uh, but no, I, I would um, generally 100% uh, agree with uh, much of what you said there. Um, my counter again, and um, this is another point I had um, when I was talking about um, uh, you know the spinning plates thing. Um, generally, uh, most women, uh, well, uh, not even most, the vast, vast majority of, uh, women in the West, uh, do not know how to be, um, good girlfriends, let alone good wives and spinning plates, uh, gives you the opportunity to basically have a crash course in, um, training women. I know, uh, I got in a lot of flack for this, um, in my, uh, debate that I have with Bertie, um, that it gives you like a crash course in how to basically train women, how to be, you know, good girlfriends and wives. And you can mold them relatively easily, uh, I might add, if, um, you know, the woman is in your frame and everything like that. And that's basically how I found it to be much more feasible to kind of get the girl you want these days. You basically like, <laughs> if you could find a girl that has like, you know, 60% of things that you're looking for there, you could basically mold her to fulfill the other 40%, uh, given enough time and effort. But you know, you're never going to find a fully pieced together, you know, woman in the West. They just don't exist. You, you have to, you have to, a good relationship is made. It's not found these days. I, I agree with that. A good relationship is always made and not found. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think uh, that's another advantage to uh, spinning the place thing, because, you know, if you can, um, for lack of a better word, you know, put your woman through the uh, training process um, throughout that period. And, um, you know, if she becomes the ideal uh, woman for you, then um, that's basically what you're looking for. Because, but, uh, I mean, one of the things, one, one of the things one that on the I think is, is a needle in the haystack. But, one yeah. of the things that I think is kind of interesting about this is I don't understand how you effectively. So, like, one of the most powerful tools or one of the most powerful things about a, a, a marriage and I would say in the genuine sense is that you're stuck with each other forever. And so because you're stuck with each other forever, you have to learn how to deal with each other. And in a Christian framework, you are, and that's my dad, a super based one as well. Cause my, my parents were both proud Catholics and they got divorced as with yeah, so many I, other. Families. I appreciate that. Uh, that the, those expectations have to be agreed to and have to be like socially enforced. Um, and it's 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 a problem, but I would say the fact that you sort of self conceptualize as stuck with each other causes you to to you know I I, I don't love the word, but for lack of a better one, train each other uh, and accept training in a way that you otherwise wouldn't. Right? If you're not stuck with with uh, your wife, your husband, uh, there's a lot more. Uh, prospect of, of peeling out than there is a uh, prospect of accepting transformation. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Could be something um, to that again, like, and a lot of this also comes, um, you know, from my own personal anecdotes as well. Like I wouldn't, um, 
I wouldn't hold these positions I had if I didn't, you know, think that they also served me like in my own life as well. And I saw success with them, you know, as well, you know, I mean, and absolutely, you know, like um, spinning plates and stuff like that isn't for uh, every guy. It's not, you know, uh, yet you definitely have to have a certain, you know, uh, uh, disposition uh, for it uh, to work for you. But again, this is, you know, this is why I stress very much that it's a set of tools uh, that people can use for certain things that they want. And you have to be wise enough and smart enough to know uh, which tools are going to work for you uh, based, based on what you want. So. Well, uh, I will try and synthesize here and maybe we can find some nice ways for closing remarks. Uh, gentlemen, I, I think that maybe a, a more BAP like approach may be necessary here. Um, men need to be better men. This is just hands down. I think yeah. Red Hawk is absolutely correct that it is very easy to climb up the sludge and be mm -hmm. like a much better man. Um, and in that regard, um, to be a much better man, I think also we just need to both either as, you know, your based Christian community or a guy that wants to spin plates, um, lean in feminism shit needs to die. And oh, I think yes. it needs to be Absolutely. laughed at. It needs to be scoffed at. Cheryl Sandberg should go down in the series of history of like anyone who wants to be a girl boss, anyone who thinks being pumped and dumped is liberating. That should be a primary goal, attitude, archetype of all men that need to be pursued and to do so. And I think well, that that's... I also think that all of us who have a public f footprint have a public service obligation to point out 50 year old women who are alone. Mm. Yep. Uh, yeah. There was the, you know, the, the, there was someone today, I think it was Lee Enfield on Twitter who had posted the, you know, like the no bitches meme with the mega mind or whatever it is. He said, uh, he, he, he redid the text that said no husband or kids. And he's been quote tweeting that at every Nina Jankowitz character he finds. <laughs> and I think that that's something that needs to be done uh, writ large, but uh, what I, th that needs to be happened on both sides here, gentlemen, I, whether it's the Christian ethic or spinning plates, I will leave, however, maybe some final words here before getting to the two super chats. There were, I think, two or three super chats that were mentioned, and then we'll we'll wrap it up there. Um, I will leave this from St. John Chrysostom's homilies on marriage and family life, since I did mention the Christian ethic. This is his homily in regards to Ephesians, and he's talking about verse 33 uh, from chapter 5 of the epistle. Uh, quoting the uh, verse itself, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband, verse 33. And uh, the good St. John Chrysostom writes, I know that some will say, how can there be love where there is fear? Especially there, I say, she who fears also loves, and she who loves her husband respects him because he is her head, head in terms of the household. Also, she loves him because he is a part of her body since the head is a member of the body as well. Paul places the head of authority in the body in obedience for the sake of peace. Where there is equal authority, there is never peace. A household cannot be a democracy ruled by everyone, but the authority must necessarily rest in one person. The same is true for the church, where men are led by the Spirit of Christ, then there is peace. And I, I'm going to leave it with that, and I'm going to, to get to the Super Chats, I think that this does deserve a, another follow-up discussion in the future, um, especially maybe with other guests as well. I know Praise of Falling and a few others, like Charlemagne, had some thoughts they wanted to get in. But, if I um, make one point off of that last um, uh, Sure, go for it. it. Um, so on addressing the uh, you know statement of fear, which I very much agree with, uh, because um, in society today, uh, basically like the, you know, the fear of, ostracization from your community from your church um you know has been you know completely destroyed by feminism you know like uh women will be respected for any decision that they have basically the only way you can actually institute that fear which you know comes with respect from your woman these days is the fear of missing out basically so essentially if you are like the high value kind of alpha chad kind of character guy which again ties into what i was saying about you know becoming better for yourself that essentially is the best and pretty much the only way for you to keep uh, women in line uh, in today's society because the church isn't going to do it. The state isn't going to do it. So basically, you just have to be, you know, what the woman wants, essentially. And what the woman wants is uh, a rich alpha guy who's jacked, uh, who's good at sex and, you know, can protect her in times of need and, you know, has a don't give a fuck, you know, take no shit attitude. So that's all I'll say. Black Horse, any final thoughts? I think I've said what I, what I, I, I mean, 
I think I've said what I what I wanted to say. Uh, what I, I'll leave it as this is that um, the world is innately fallen. the The world that I would like ideally is about over a hundred years ago, and I think that the repeal of the twentieth century is a good start, but we can do better. <laughs> yeah, and um, that in this regard, I think that we are also like Red Hawk had mentioned, we are shaped by our experiences, and we are shaped by what kind of socializes us in this regard. Um, you know, you can't, you know, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Uh, I just fucking, I think that's, that might, that might work for horses. I don't think that, I don't think that works for women. Um, you are, nah. you, you have to, you have to be the man that can put them into the position that they need to be in. Um, and unfortunately we've seen the inverse of that dynamic and we're seeing those social consequences, uh, go to a, a place where like men now want to become women and women want to be men. We can refer back to the whole tomboy abs thing as well. I, think well, I also a- think one of the things that's both women and men are encouraged to remain children for a very, very long time. Oh, and we've been infantilized a- for well beyond thing. The fact that man child is in common parlance is a, is an issue um, because there's, there's a big problem when a lot of men get really excited over like, I mean, it's all the reason why we have like remakes and nostalgia bait and why Disney still yeah. makes money. And it's a bunch of childless fucking millennials going to Disneyland and like, it's the yeah. meme from it's always sunny where like the last two children in Disneyland see each other in a wave of like 40 year old, like childless. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's um, also changing so incredibly fast. You know? Very. Like, uh, even like in the last disaster. 10 years, it's nuts. I saw this this weekend when I'm, um, uh, you know, uh, Paul, myself and, um, um, you know, one of the organizers from the event um, went out to a couple of bars and just hearing the conversations between myself and one of the older guys, you know, there as well about like how different the, uh, club scene was 10 years ago versus five years ago versus even you know two years ago before the coof as you know and compared to what it is right now like this this marketplace is adapting very 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 quickly um and not in a good direction well i'm glad that everyone managed to find some extra things to to add in for uh <laughs> for final thoughts um but with that, I'm going to get to the super chats here, gentlemen, and then we'll hopefully wrap this sucker up. So let's uh, let's go here uh, to the supers. There were a couple. Uh, the first one came from Colby and Amori for twenty dollars U.S. Um, totally not on topic, but I'll read it anyway. Thank you for the money. Uh, needed to spread the word that Pete Kionis banned me last night for criticism of Fuentes. Figured that the community should know this. Defense of that sort of containment is suspect at best. Calls into the question into the friend-enemy scale. I don't know the context there, Colvian. I know that Pete was having somebody on his channel the other day who had an issue getting his documentary canceled about Nick Fuentes. So, I mean, he seems open to having conversations about him, and I don't think that it wouldn't have been done without a proper context. Pete is definitely in the camp of our guy, considering that he's talked to myself, Charlemagne, AA, Thomas 777, and more. So, I, but I'll shoot him a message or something. But good to know. And again, thanks for the donation. Uh, Doe917 for $5 US. He says, the comparison for women in terms of status hierarchies is not accurate in modern times because dating apps and one night stands on demand, etc. Yeah, I think yeah. we address this later in the stream. Yeah, I think yeah. so too. Yeah. Um, and then uh, last but not least, Indy for one ninety nine US. He says, "Praying for you, Red Hawk." Uh, I gladly accept all prayers. And for the record, uh, uh, you know, all Christians in our sphere, particularly those that I have shaken hands with and broken bread with, uh, are not my enemies. You know, um, uh, you know, you guys are absolutely you know friends. So. Well, with that being said, um, I will be praying for you both tonight. And um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, would, I know I have your links in the description, but is there anything that you would like to shill? Um, well, uh, what I will shill is that um, uh, coming up either uh, this Sunday or next Sunday, uh, the Man's Hour uh, is being launched. Um, we're going to do uh, episode one on uh, AA's channel, and then subsequent episodes will be on my own channel. So um, uh, you know, be on the lookout for that. Um, so the women's hour is going to have some competition. So black horse, anything you'd like to throw in there? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, you can look at my work on Radlib's channel or over on Lambda Bible Studies. And I do have your Twitter linked in the description. Um, as for me, uh, this Sunday, I will not have a regular geopolitical episode of the Sunday stream. I will be recording um, on this uh, podcast called The Seed Pod, hosted by Griff Shop and DFW. I will be on with Bog Beef and uh, Turtle Taub. So it'll be a fun time. It's a very Texas-themed episode, considering that's where we're all from. So that should be a good time. I'll let you all have a link when it is available uh, until then, I'm still working on some stuff for patron exclusives, so by all means, have that in the subscribe star, and I'll be posting some more announcements uh, later. I wasn't going to do it on this stream, so just keep your eye out for a community tab post. But uh, again, gentlemen, thank you for coming on. I thought that this conversation would be uh, much better in a more civil format with some light moderation rather than uh, anything like that. So thank you all so much for coming on. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Prude. This was a lot of fun. All right. I'll see you all later and take care, everybody. We'll see you around.